Hey listeners, this is the English adaptation of Humo, Murder and Silence in El Salvador. Para español, vuelva al feed y selecciona el título en español. Join the conversation on social media by tagging at This is Sonoro. The episode you're about to listen to contains descriptions of physical violence and stories of victims of disappearance. Listener discretion is advised. Paloma que extiende sus alas, cruzando el espacio, va surcando al cielo, vaga el pensamiento. That's Miriam Elizondo. She's been looking for her 14 year old son, Josué, since he disappeared in 2011. In her words, it's been an all consuming search, and it's been in vain. Now, she's standing in front of journalists, activists, and other family members searching for their missing relatives, singing for them, but thinking of her son. Medium is a part of a WhatsApp group for mothers of missing children. It's a source of support and advice for many mothers of the missing. That group was founded by Ibet Toledo while her neighbors, friends, and family had abandoned her out of fear. Ibet's story resonated with other mothers with missing children. Soon, she began receiving messages. They told her how much they admired her, appreciated her courage, her bravery. Ibet heard from so many other mothers that she decided to start a WhatsApp group where they could swap messages of support and advice. As more mothers joined, they became a collective, a force, forming the basis for the Bloque de Búsqueda de Familiares de Desaparecidos en El Salvador, the search block for relatives of the disappeared in El Salvador. It built on the historic efforts of Comadres, a group of mothers and relatives to find loved ones who disappeared during the Civil War. During the country's Civil War, Families like my own grappled with a charged, dangerous political environment that kept them from finding and grieving their loved ones. We still don't have answers. For decades, tens of thousands of people have disappeared. It's a crisis. Yet since the war ended, or perhaps because it ended, this has gradually become normal. But with the discovery of the mass graves in Chalchapa and Nuevo Cuscatlan, something changed. Yvette had been brave enough to speak up. Now, she created a community, a community that was coming together to demand justice. The search, the long, lonely, and often fruitless search for a missing family member, no longer had to be done alone. Dozens of family connected in the group to cheer each other on, to search together, and now to demand the state do its job, finding their kids and seeking justice from those responsible for their disappearances. Several human rights groups joined too, backing the demands of the search block with lawyers and resources. On February 17, 2022, the search block made its public debut. Uh, With a press conference, they wanted to make themselves heard. Medium took the microphone. Brian Avelar was one of the many reporters to join the press conference. He sat watching as relatives, friends, and others standing in solidarity with the missing persons spoke up. They shared their experiences and their hopes to one day find their missing loved ones. After the press conference, Brian joined several of the parents in their search. He saw just how far these parents are willing to go to find their children. My name is Daniel Alvarenga. 
I'm a Salvadoran American journalist. Join me and hear how the discovery of a mass grave in El Salvador uncovered a crisis of violence and corruption, reaching up to the highest levels of government. It's a crisis that I followed from afar, but that ended up touching close to home. For Sonoro Media, in collaboration with Revista Factu, this is Humo, Murder and Silence in El Salvador. Episode 6, The Search. After the opening press conference, the mothers and other members of the search block boarded a bus. They were headed for the Institute of Legal Medicine, a state-funded medical institution that supports investigations, to demand more timely updates so that families aren't left waiting in the lurch, wondering, sometimes strangely hoping, that if a dead body is found, it belongs to their missing loved one. The rented passenger bus was adorned with balloons and photos of the missing people. El Bus de los Milagros. The Bus of Miracles. Miriam boarded the bus. She was carrying a photo of her son, Josué, and a small sheet of folded paper. A copy of a letter that she had sent to President Nayib Bukele almost three years prior. Josué had been missing for more than 10 years. Miriam had exhausted all her resources to find him. So she wrote to President Bukele, stating her case. El dolor de una desaparición no se compara con nada de este mundo. Explaining how her life was consumed by the search. The crisis of missing persons isn't new. It's just the latest painful turn in the violence that's plagued the country for decades. A 2021 report found that between 2009 and 2019, the Salvadoran police received approximately 18,000 missing persons complaints. This means that on average, five people disappeared every day. It's a cruel reality for the families and loved ones of the missing people. A strange and confusing limbo. They must contemplate the possibility their loved one is alive and probably suffering or they must consider death. And then, there's the pain of not being able to give them a proper burial. The pain is unbearable. Not just the pain of loss, but the pain of not knowing. When my uncle died during the Civil War, my mom was called to identify his body. But because of the mysterious circumstances surrounding his death, she couldn't really participate in his funeral. She had to stay away to pretend to be a bystander. She never really got to mourn him. Then, in the chaos of the war, his plaque and body were moved. She doesn't have a gravesite she can visit. So that's part of what I had come to El Salvador to try and figure out, with help from Israel Ticas, the country's top criminologist, until his attention was diverted by the discovery of a mass grave in Chalchuapa. It's a countrywide crisis, but President Bukele's administration had other priorities. With his security plan in motion, the young president's focus was firmly on technology and tourism. In 2021, he made a stunning announcement. At a cryptocurrency conference in Wynwood, Miami's hip and colorful design district, he boldly announced that El Salvador would be the first country to adopt Bitcoin as national currency. He pledged to return the following year with an update for attendees, though a crisis at home would keep him from returning to Miami. President Bukele was also looking to boost tourism. In February 2021, he announced the Road to Surf City. The ambitious $100 million infrastructure plan would build a modern road supporting more tourism to the country's beaches. While President Bukele was announcing these flashy new projects, 
garnering all the U.S. and international media attention. The mothers of the search block boarded the bus. Brian and other reporters joined them. He met more than a dozen mothers that day. They carried posters with photos of their missing children and phone numbers to call with any information. A red-haired woman seemed happy, almost giddy, to be joining the search block. She told Brian that she finally felt less alone. She had support, company, in the long search for her son. This is Eneida. Son madres igual, común y corriente, que están con esta situación y ellas están con la disposición de ayudarnos a pegar afiches. Ordinary people coming together to do the necessary work. They take turns supporting each other's searches. They come together to put up posters, talk to people, and spread the word. Then they do it all over again for another one of the missing people. They rent the bus when they can to travel the longer distances for the search, or to make a statement, like they did that day at the Institute of Legal Medicine. Anetha was grateful for the group. Like so many others, she was doing the heavy lifting because the authorities had abandoned her. She had gone to the police when her son was first missing. They handed her a folder. Inside were dozens of photos of corpses. Aneda carefully went through the horrific images. None of them were her son. That was it. She didn't get much help beyond that. It seemed like the police weren't interested in finding her son. So she took matters into her own hands. She became the de facto investigator in her own case. Like so many others dealing with disappearances in the country, myself included, and I have the training as a journalist, to do that kind of work. Every day since then, she's gone out into the streets to put up posters with her son's photo. She shares them with people she meets along the way, asking for any information. But I enjoyed one of her searches. Buenas. Fíjese que andamos buscando una persona. Sí. El encargado del dormitorio. Sí, el encargado no hay. No hay encargado. Brian watches as Ineda talks about her son to strangers. She tells them he's a 22-year-old boy, athletic, who likes to run in the morning. You can hear the love in her voice. It's not an easy task. Ineda does this day after day. For her, it's become a full-time job. For Ineda and many others, the search has consumed their lives. Finding a missing person in El Salvador requires hope, courage, and creativity. Don Ricardo has been searching for his son since the beginning of 2022. Every evening, he goes out and walks the streets of San Salvador, the capital city. On one cold February day, Brian and his colleague, Hersen Najera, Join Don Ricardo in his search. Don Ricardo brought a backpack. He carried a lit cigar between his fingers. They set out, driving through some of what were known as the city's red zones. By day, they were just regular city streets with stores open and people walking around. Typical hustle and bustle. But at night, the city's red zones became ghost towns. These streets were poorly lit with very few cars, and even fewer people. Quiet, almost silent. The two reporters watched as Don Ricardo made a handful of stops. Sometimes, he put up photos of his son. Other times, he talked to the few people milling about after dark. Like many parts of El Salvador, the so-called red zones in the capital city were ruled by an invisible law. Where Don Ricardo, Brian, and Harrison were driving, there was a strong 18th Street presence. At night, the streets transformed into hotspots for drug sales, crime, and other gang-related activities. Oh, 
estaba diciendo que yo lo buscaba a mi hijo mayor que se me extravió hasta el primero de enero. Yo aquí lo llevaron la fotografía de él por si acaso. Most people avoided these streets at night, but Don Ricardo was so committed to his search, he was willing to brave it. With Brian and Harrison in tow, he approached two men. Brian could see that they were armed, potentially gang affiliated. Still, Don Ricardo was undeterred. Yo no, brother. Puta, no me conoce vos. Estando mi hijo, cabrón, no te conté vos que mi hijo se ha partido, mi hijo mayor, Carlos. He was relentless, asking these armed men about his missing son, Carlos. They didn't know anything, and Don Ricardo sets off again. Atravesábamos una zona muy conocida por la fuerte venta de drogas. Por eso pienso que Don Ricardo, la verdad, es el extremo superior de lo que alguien haría por encontrar a su hijo desaparecido. For years, for any Salvadoran, trekking these streets alone, in the dark, was complete madness. The low light and solitude made the perfect setting for anything to happen. Assault, murder, or even worse, disappearing. Don Ricardo was willing to take that risk for months, to find his son, to do what the police, the government failed to do. He walked the darkest and most dangerous streets of San Salvador, asking gang members, drug traffickers, and whoever else he encountered if they had seen his son. Don Ricardo search where no one else dared. In the dark. Night after night, Don Ricardo approached some of the city's most dangerous men to ask for help. Sometimes, they did offer to help. Here's a voice note he received from a gang member. Y hasta ahorita, pues, no pude ver nada. Nothing. But at least he looked. Don Ricardo did take one precaution. If you can even call it that. He called the police every night to warn them that he'd be out in the streets, searching, alone. The police usually said, okay, no problem. They didn't try to stop him. They simply slapped him on the back and said, good luck with that. It's not by choice. Don Ricardo works full time during the day at a factory. He must continue to support his family. Don Ricardo knew these streets were dangerous, searching at night. It's reckless even, but he continued searching because he must. Nobody else would do it. Each night, he crossed the invisible borders marking gang control territory, again and again. It wasn't an easy journey for the journalists who joined him. Traveling around these areas at night required not only being brave, but also perhaps a bit suicidal. But Don Ricardo isn't suicidal. He did it because he must, to find his son. He still has hope he's alive. Don Ricardo also made it work. Somehow, for years, he was a basketball coach in these same neighborhoods. Many of his students were the children of gang members or later went on to become gang members. He thinks this connection is what allowed him to come and go. Each night, Don Ricardo set out to find his son Carlos, the athletic young man who likes to run. The same young man that Ineda is searching for. Yo soy la madre de Carlos Ernesto Santos Abarca. Él es el primer desaparecido del bloque de ese año del 2022. Eneda and Don Ricardo, both parents committed to finding their son, Carlos. The search for Carlos Santos is 24-7. During the day, his mother, Eneida, looks for him, sometimes with support from the search block. At night, his father, Don Ricardo, searches for him in the darkest corners of San Salvador. Carlos was a psychology student in the city. He loved sports, especially basketball. At the end of 2021, 
He told his dad he wanted to start a basketball team with young people from the neighborhood. He wanted to give them a purpose, to create a winning team. On New Year's Day, 2022, Carlos woke up early to go for a run. Don Ricardo asked him to wait. He'd rest, and they'd go out together. He went back to sleep. When he woke up, Carlos was gone. Hours passed. Don Ricardo and Aneda started to worry. They called the police to report their missing son. Since that day, both Don Ricardo and Aneda have not stopped looking. They continue to search, driven by the idea that Carlos is still alive. Primeramente Dios, con esperanza. Si no, es que yo no me siento que, que no lo voy a encontrar, con esperanza. Both seem to have an unwavering conviction. They don't stop. They are afraid, but they are also hopeful. Both keep the faith that Carlos is still alive. Don Ricardo shared a few parting words with the reporters after they joined his nighttime search. Even when he loses hope, he retains his faith. He feels, as Eneda does, that this is a test from God. The hardest test for any parent, but a test nonetheless. Brian reflects on those words. He thinks about the other parents he's met along the way. Like what Don Julio said when Brian asked why he continued to search for his son, Ismael, para que se le caiga ese dolor que trae en el pecho, to ease the pain he feels in his chest, and the sentiment Miriam expressed in her letter to President Nayib Bukele. El dolor de una desaparición no se compara con nada de este mundo. Es como si me sacaron el corazón. It's an incomparable pain, like having your heart ripped out. Hope and pain. It's what keeps families searching. Every day. And sometimes at night. It's what brings mothers like Aneda to the search block. The collective power of the search block was also helping families confront the government directly. Saira Navas a lawyer, joined the mothers for their first public appearance. She warned that government data on disappearances was inaccurate. Voluntary absences. The government could claim fewer disappearances, downplaying the crisis. Security Minister Gustavo Villatoro and others in the Bukele administration were using the new label to claim that the number of disappearances had fallen. Missing persons reports, they said, weren't the same as actual disappearances. But this new label implies that Josue, Carlos, and Ismael didn't disappear. That instead, they decided to leave. The government was choosing to evade responsibility rather than to look into these cases, into this crisis. As we are recording this podcast, only one of the 38 cases affiliated with the search block has been resolved by authorities. Still, official homicide figures were at relatively low levels for the first time in years. Even as a search block and others raised questions about disappearances, Bukele could tout the success of his security plan in reducing the homicide rate, freeing him up to focus on boosting tourism and Bitcoin. Then, on March 25th, 2022, something shifted. After two years of relative calm, the country experienced an explosive resurgence of violence. Returning now to the rise in gang violence in El Salvador. The, the National Civil Police reporting 14 people murdered on Friday and 62 the following day, making Saturday one of the deadliest days in 30 years. To a bloody weekend, 62 homicides on Saturday. 
As you can hear from the clips, the gravity of the issue garnered the attention of international media. In just two days, a series of violent murders across the country shook the fragile sense of peace. Brian was with other journalists at the time. Entonces, vimos que el, algo estaba de verdad, de verdad, realmente fuera de control. Que algo muy malo, muy malo estaba pasando para que los homicidios no se detuvieran. It felt like the killings would never end. The reports kept rolling in, minute by minute. The death toll mounted. President Bukele was preparing his return trip to Miami. Two weeks later, he decided to cancel the trip. His plans to promote El Salvador as a crypto paradise, it would have to wait. He had matters to attend to at home. He'd managed to downplay the mass graves and the country's crisis of disappearances. But this shocking explosion of violence was impossible to ignore. Before his eyes, the image he'd spent three years building of a safe, modern country was crumbling. Humo, Murder and Silence in El Salvador is a Sonoro original series in collaboration with Revista Factum. This episode was produced by Fernanda Estrada and Hannah Bottom with the help of Sara Mota and Angelina Mosher Salazar. Written by Sara Mota, Brian Avelar, and Fernanda Estrada. Adaptation by Hannah Bottom. Hosted by Daniel Alvarenga. Edited by Rodrigo Crespo and Nick Milanes. The managing editor was Rodrigo Crespo. Reporting by Angelina Mosher Salazar, Brian Avelar, Fernando Romero, and Gerson Najera. Factum's team coordination and editorial consulting by Orus Villacorta. Fact checking by Evelyn Uribe. Tape sync by Gerson Najera and Marvin Ciliesa. Mix and sound design by Fernando Galaviz. Original music by Laura Cruz and Hector Fernandez. Executive producers Jasmine Romero, Camila Victoriano, Jerónimo Ávila, and Joshua Weinstein. Thanks to Neno Leal for allowing us to use her song La Almohada de Una Madre. And thanks to Miriam Elizondo for sharing her voice with us. <laughs>